Brad McDonald joins us now once again. He's a retired U.S. Navy captain who served on five different submarines. Uh, good morning to you, sir. Thanks for thanks for being back with us on Morning in America. Good morning. So officials said in a press conference Wednesday, I think, you know, we've all been glued to these daily updates from investigators. They said in this press conference that this was still very much, quote, still a search and rescue mission. But it's estimated at this very hour that the oxygen supply has run out. So how does that change the search? When does this switch to recovery instead? <laughs> Well, it's probably worth noting that there was one miracle in the U.S. Navy uh, recovering submariners who were thought to be lost, but that was in 1939, mm -hmm. a long time ago. USS Escuela sank, and uh, of the crew, 29 men were rescued from a, with a diving bell, uh, but that was only in 240 feet of water, and this is obviously a different story. Uh, I can't speak to when the Coast Guard will decide we shift from search and rescue to recovery, but a couple of interesting uh, thoughts that I had uh, one of your reporters just mentioned that an hour and 45 minutes into the dive is when communications were lost. And I was wondering uh, what those communications were right before they were lost. When USS Thresher sank in 1963, the, uh, there were three transmissions over the underwater telephone from Thresher that were received by the uh, rescue ship Skylark, which of course could not affect a rescue, and those transmissions were experiencing minor difficulties, attempting to blow, have positive up angle, but the next thing that was heard were metallic sounds, which was the implosion of Thresher. So it'd be interesting to know what the communications right. were. Yeah. And you, you know, you referenced miracles. We're going to actually touch on that a little bit later in the show. Um, you know, miracles that have defied odds, and we're hoping that this is also the same case. When we came on the air yesterday morning at this hour, we had the breaking development that crews were hearing those underwater banging noises every half hour. If those sounds were, in fact, coming from the missing sub, are, are you surprised that the crew wasn't found yesterday? Well, uh, noises like that, you know, noises in the ocean are a difficult thing to discern. And these noises, I believe, were picked up by a sonar buoy dropped by a P-3 aircraft. And a sonar buoy will uh, receive a noise, but it won't be able to tell you the distance away, of course, because mm -hmm. this was just a passive noise. And one sonar buoy won't be able to tell you the direction either. These noises could have come from a few miles away. They could have come from 100 miles away, depending on the acoustic conditions. Now, any submarine sailor knows that a metallic noise is human generator. It's made by a ship. It's not, it's not coming from the sea or biologics, so that it is a unique noise. Uh, but where it came from and how far away, that's hard to say. If if I, I or any of my former shipmates were stranded in, in some type of submersible or submarine underwater, one thing we would know would be to signal with a wrench or a pipe or something, a metal on metal, and probably bang out SOS. To know, make the loudest sure. noise pos possible. Yeah, but if you banged out SOS every 30 minutes, it would be very distinct. You would know this is not just a random noise from a ship. If you heard it, you would know, oh, this is somebody signaling distress. Whether this uh, five people on this submersible uh, have that kind of training to know that, uh, I don't yeah. know. And, Captain, uh, one last question for you. If crews are able to locate this sub, uh, you know, as we mentioned right off the top, the uh, investigators believe oxygen is likely now depleted or at least very low. How long could it take to get that sub back up to the surface? And and what do you think the, the chances are of, of seeing that happen? Yeah, I'm not an expert in recovery operations. And I was really surprised uh, when the uh, Russian submarine Kursk uh, of course, it was many months after it sank, but it was actually brought back from, uh, but it was only 400 feet deep. Uh, I, I So I was surprised at that. I suspect there is some uh, way to get a line or a hook on this thing, if you can find it sitting on the bottom and bring it back. I, I, I have uh, hope is a good thing, but uh, realistically, it's hard to imagine that they're, these f folks have survived this long. And one other thing about the auction is a lot has been made about how much auction there is, but I wonder what the capability of this thing to clean uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere is. Does it have any kind of equipment yeah. to do that? Good. Yeah, because good four question. Days of carbon and I think dioxide, yeah, it's a lot. A, a lot of people have their doubts there when you hear that this thing had a, a gaming controller steering wheel, no seats. Um, you do wonder what the full capabilities are, and not to mention 
um, kind of past legal issues that we're now learning about today with uh, Ocean Gate. Thank you for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find News Nation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.